Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. Um, we will continue talking about uh, oscillations, mechanical oscillations. Um, the previous uh, lectures were about mechanical um, oscillations in the presence of friction, which is a constant force which prevents um, the uh, oscillations of happening, basically uh, always acting against the movement. Um, today is the first lecture um, of a set of three, actually, um, which deals with oscillations in the viscose, viscosous uh, environment. Now, um, an example of viscosous environment is, let's say, you have oscillations inside the water. So water is resisting um, the movement of the object um, at the end of the spring, and that's basically what we will be, you know, talking about. Um, so this lecture is part of the course. The course is called Physics for Teens, presented on Unisor.com. Um, I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the website, from the Unisor.com, um, rather than, let's say, from YouTube, where you might have found it. Um, using the search engine or something, um, primarily because this lecture is part of the course, and the course, the whole course, is presented on, on the on the website. It's not just an isolated lecture, which means that there are some prerequisite lectures, including there is a prerequisite co course which is called Math for Teens, and that's very important because uh, mathematics is uh, uh, very heavily utilized in in physics and uh, in this particular lecture you will see that I will heavily use the differential equa equations for, for example. So you have to know the calculus. <coughs> okay, um, so viscosity. So viscosity is a property of the environment to resist the movement and uh, well friction is also uh, resisting the movement, right? Um, but there, were, there is a fundamental difference between how the friction resists the movement, which we were analyzing in the previous two lectures, and how viscosity of the environment surrounding the oscillation is resisting the movement. Um, uh, you probably remember that friction uh, is basically dependent on um, let's say this is our spring, and this is our object, and this is some kind of a supporting surface, and there is, let's say, weight of this object, and obviously since there is a weight, there is a friction against the surface. But this force depends on the weight, which means it's constant. No matter where it goes, it's always constant. It's always against the movement, but it's always constant. <coughs> now, in case of viscosity, uh, let's say the whole thing is underwater, there is no friction. Well, the viscosity is characterized by the fact that it increases as the speed of the object increases. So, in case of, let's say, spring, the force is proportional to displacement, right? The greater the displacement, the greater the force. That's the Hooke's law. Um, in case of a friction, um, the force is constant. It depends basically on the weight and uh, some kind of friction coefficient. In case of viscosity, so if this the whole thing is under water, <coughs> um, the, uh, the force which resists the movement depends on the speed. Well, obviously, it's not exactly. We are talking about you know certain reasonable interval of speeds, um, where we can actually say that the force um, of viscosity, as the function of t, is proportional to the speed of the object, and not only it's proportional, it's always directed against the speed. So that's why I'm. I can see, and what is the speed? Speed is the first derivative of 
the distance from the neutral position. So if this is some kind of a zero neutral position of the spring, it's not stretched, it's not um, squeezed, then whenever you are moving to the next location, that would be a function of time. Location, the distance from from zero, it will be a function of time. It will be positive if you are stretching the spring. It will be negative if the spring is uh, squeezed. So this is our function x of t, which characterizes the position relative to the neutral. This is the first derivative, which is speed, and the force uh, of resistance of the surrounding environment. If this environment is viscosus, then it's proportional with some kind of a coefficient c. Well, what c depends on? Well, it obviously depends on the shape of this object. Um, let's say, well, the bigger the object, the more the resistance, obviously, um, the surrounding uh, material actually, let's say it's water, um, actually acts against it. Uh, it obviously depends on properties of the surrounding environment. Let's say, uh, oscillations in the water would probably be with less resistance than oscillation inside um, honey, let's say. Honey is a very viscous um, uh, environment. So, well, and uh, uh, at the same time, there is air. Air is also ha has certain viscosity, but much less than the water, obviously. So in any case, whatever surrounds the oscillation might have certain viscosity, and this coefficient is basically characterizing um, how strong the forces of resistance are acting. And again, it depends on the object itself, not on the mass, more on the shape of the object. Um, and uh, also it depends on the properties of surrounding. So that's very important force. Now, what other forces are acting on the object? Well, obviously the spring itself. And we know the Hooke's law, and we know the expression for the force. It depends on the distance. Um, so the force of the spring is minus, again, some kind of coefficient multiplied by displacement. And again, it's a minus sign because if displacement is positive, the force is directing this way, which means negatively, right? And if, the for, uh, and if x uh, of t is negative, which means spring is squeezed, our uh, object is here, the force is directed that way, which is the positive direction. So that's why it's minus here. So these are two forces which are acting. Now, what do we know from the second Newton's law, that the sum of all these forces, the total force, as a function of t, obviously, a function of time, is equal to mass times acceleration. Acceleration is the second derivative of the distance, right? So this is the total force, and that's the result of acting of this total force. But this total force is equal to sum of these, which means this is equal to minus c x minus k x of t. So what do we have now? We have differential equation, which basically describes function x of t, describes the position, which basically what we want. So we want to find out what is the law of movement what is x this distance from the zero as a function of time? Well, now we can say that whatever the function x of c is, it's supposed to satisfy this differential equation. Now this is, let me just rewrite this differential equation a little differently. differential equation. Now, this is a linear differential equation, linear because we have 
only the first degree of function, its derivative and its um, second derivative, with some coefficients. Okay. Now, uh, it's, a dif it's a differential equation of the second order because it's a second derivative here. Now, um, at this point I would actually like you to um, maybe refresh your knowledge about differential equations. Um, we did talk about this a few times and again in the prerequisite course which is called Mass for Teens on the same website you can find the whole chapter dedicated to differential equations. There are different ways to basically solve them, etc. Now, the linear differential equation of the second order, it has certain general solution. Be because it's not only one function which can satisfy this, but let's say you have another function which is, uh, let's say you found one particular function, x1 of t, which satisfies this equation. Obviously, if you will multiply by any uh, coefficient, it will also satisfy, because this is just multiplication by a constant, and this will be a times x1, this will be a times x uh, prime and uh, x, the second derivative, so a will basically uh, cancel out and uh, obviously the same uh, equation will be satisfied. Now, what if you have two different functions, x1 and x2? which satisfy this particular uh, uh, differential equation. Well, then you can say that linear combination of these functions will also satisfy, right? Because again, it, it, it's a linear equation, so if x1 satisfies and x2 satisfies, then a times x1 plus b times x2 will also satisfy, because you will have here a times x uh, plus b times x, x time, uh, a times x prime plus b times uh, uh, x prime. So you will open all the parentheses and each one, x1 will be equal to 0 and x2 will be equal to 0. So obviously they're linear combination also. Now, there is also a certain theorem in the theory of differential equations of the, let's say in this particular case, second order. So, if you have a second-order linear differential equation, then it's sufficient to find two functions which satisfy, not proportional to each other, which satisfy this equation. And then linear combination of these functions will basically cover all the possible solutions, which is, this means it's a general solution. So you have to find two partial solutions, and then any combination of these two partial solutions will also be a solution, but it will describe a general solution, which means no other solution but these, uh, uh, but, but, the, but, but described by, by this equation with different A and B, obviously. No other solution exists. So it's, it's sufficient to find this, uh, um, the solution to this particular differential equation, Obviously, zero is important. That's why we can just do this type of thing. Um, so um, it's sufficient to find two partial solutions, two concrete functions, which satisfy this particular solution. Well, if it was a third degree, it would be three functions. I mean, the third derivative. If, we, if, it, if it's an nth derivative, it would be n function, which would be sufficient not proportional to each other, non-linearly dependent on each other. So if you will find uh, uh, n particular uh, partial solutions, then the linear combination of them will describe general solution. It's really a very nice theory, very nice theorem about differential equations. And um, it's kind of beautiful, actually. Um, the same thing, if you remember, there is a famous theorem that among complex numbers, the uh, algebraic equation of the nth degree, and then we have x to the nth degree, always have always has um, n complex solutions. That's very important and very beautiful theorem, actually. Well, this is kind of sim uh, similar. So you have a differential equation of the second order, linear differential equation, which is equal to zero in this case. There are no constants here. Constant would be a different story. But if it's something like this, 
then you have to just find two of them. Okay, so our purpose to solve this particular um, equation. So we have to find two different solutions and then we will describe the general solution. How to choose which one of these is really the solution? Well, you have initial conditions. For any differential equation, if you would like to have exact solution, you need um, initial conditions. And how many additional conditions? Again, two. It's a second order, so we need two initial conditions. So we need two partial functions, which are uh, solutions, and you need two additional conditions. That's all because it's a second degree equation. Again, kind of beautiful, I would say. So, do we have uh, initial condition? Well, I didn't specify them, but initial condition means that you have to specify the first derivative, uh, the, the function and the, and the first derivative. So, function at moment zero is equal to something, which means we have stretched or squeezed our spring to a certain uh, degree. And uh, first derivative, do we push after we stretch or, s or squeeze, do we push in some direction um, our uh, object? Well, for simplicity, I have decided that this we can just set to the A. Um, well, let's say it's greater than zero, it doesn't really matter. So we are stretching by A. And then we let it go without any push, which means speed is equal to zero, initial speed. So these are two conditions which we will apply after we will find two particular, two partial solutions. We have to find A and B. And to, fi to find A and B, we will use this thing by substituting 0 to here and to here, and having the first derivative and also substituting 0. And that would be two equations for A and B with two unknown, A and B. And that would be sufficient to find A and B. And that would be a, a real concrete solution to this particular differential equation with these initial conditions. Basically, our physics has finished here. Now it's all mathematics. So we have to know how to solve this differential equation and how to find A and B in this particular case. Okay, Solution to this differential equation can be found relatively easily by... Um, it's a trick, if you wish. Yeah, it's a trick. We will look for solutions among certain category of functions which are very kind of easy to use in this particular case. The functions which we are uh, which we will use are e to the some kind of a uh, gamma t where gamma is some kind of a constant. I don't know this constant but why have I chosen this? Well let's think about it. the first derivative of this is gamma e to the gamma t. And the second derivative is gamma square e to the gamma t. Now, if you are not comfortable with first and second derivative, I don't think you really should go into physics, quite frankly. You should go back to mathematics and learn calculus. So, I'm just using this. This is kind of a simple thing. And what happens if I will substitute x, x uh, prime, and, uh, x, 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 and the second derivative of x into this equation. Well, let's just think about what happens. It's really very easy. So we will have m gamma square e to the gamma t plus c gamma e to the gamma t plus k e to the gamma t equals to zero. And what do I do next? e to the gamma t is never equal to zero, so I can safely cancel it divide the whole thing by e to the power of gamma t. And what do I have? I have a quadratic, a quadratic equation. From this quadratic equation, I can find two uh, solutions, two different gammas. 
generally speaking, complex, but it all depends on discriminant of this quadratic equation. Remember, um, c square minus 4mk. This is called discriminant. So if it's positive, then I will have two different po uh, real solutions. Because solution to this thing is equal to what? Um, 1 over 2m minus c plus minus square root of c square minus 4mk. You see, this is discriminant. If it's positive, it means I can extract the square root among the real numbers, and I will have two different real numbers, and that means that I will have two different solutions for gamma, not proportional to each other. So one solution would be with plus, another solution would be with minus. So these are two solutions with gamma, which means I will have two different functions. So I will have gamma 1 and gamma 2, both real. Not only real, but let's, let's think about the following. This is negative, right? So we are assuming all these coefficients, c and k, <coughs> and obviously m, they're all positive, right? So minus c is negative. Now, this, well, from c squared we are uh, subtracting something. Result is still positive, but obviously the result will be smaller than c squared, right? Because m and k are positive. Which means that square root will be smaller than c, which means whether we are plus or minus, this minus will be po by absolute value greater than this one, so the result will always be negative. So both gamma 1 and gamma 2 will be negative. That's very important. Now, I have x of t is equal to e to the gamma 1 t, and that will be x1, and x2 of t would be e to the gamma 2 t. So these are gamma 1 and 2, and both, and both are negative. <coughs> this. Now, at this particular moment, I would like to refer you to um, the notes for this lecture on unizor.com. Now, uh, every lecture at unizor.com has very detailed notes. Basically, whatever I'm talking about right now is all written down, like a textbook. And uh, I really uh, scrupulously put all the calculations in the text itself, which I don't want to hear. But in any case, you understand that I have already found my um, gamma. I'm sorry, that's gamma. I found my two gammas, which means I have two different solutions. The formulas are rather long, that's why I'm not really doing it any, doing, doing it here. But it's all quite doable. I mean, from now on, you can just do it yourself, basically. Since I know these two functions, I know two partial solutions to my differential equation, so now I know the general solution. All I have to do is to find A and B. And uh, I will find it using my initial conditions. So if I will substitute 0 <coughs> into this, so x1 is e to the gamma 1t, and, and x2 is e to the gamma 2t. If I will substitute 0, I will have e to the power of 0, which means 1. So this thing result in a times 1 plus b times 1, which is a plus b, equal to a. So what I do have right now is I have a plus b equals to a from this particular equation. Now, how about this one? Well, if I will do the same thing here, I will have a gamma 1 uh, e to the power gamma 1 t plus b to the gamma 1 uh, gamma 2, sorry. 
e to the power gamma 2t. That's my first derivative, right? If x1 is this and x2 is this, then this is a derivative. And at point 0, which means t is equal to 0, which means I have to put this one and this one, e to the power of 0 is 1, that's equal to 0. So this is another equation. So I have two um, equations with two unknowns, a and b, and that gives me basically a and b. And, um, well, knowing a and b, I know the exact solution to my particular problem. Now, <coughs> here is a very interesting thing. Um, you noticed when I said that both uh, gamma 1 and gamma, two and gamma 2 are um, negative. So what does it mean? Well, if this is negative, it means that the graph is like this. And if this is negative, the graph is like this. They're both going through number 1 at 0, and then they go to uh, 0 uh, when t goes to infinity. So obviously we have to consider only positive t, that's the time, so from time equal to 0 forward. And as you see, both components, since gamma 1 and gamma 2 are negative, are going down. So what does it mean? It means that the distance, this is the combination of these two, and obviously since the, each one of them is going to zero, their combination is goes to, linear combination goes to zero as well, right? So it means that the distance goes to zero, distance from the neutral position. So whenever we're, we have stretched it and let it go, it will move two words um, initial uh, position, neutral position, but it will never actually reach it, but it will be infinitely close as the time goes by. So, infin infinitesimally uh, close to, to, to the neutral position. And that is the graph of the whole thing, actually. I mean, you can the sum, the linear sum of these two will also have the same, si the same shape. Um, and what's interesting is <coughs> it always goes monotonically goes towards the neutral position. It will never reach it. I mean, in this ideal situation, obviously, we're talking about ideal uh, model. It's not the reality. Obviously, in reality, sooner or later, it will be somewhere in, in a very close neighborhood. But in, in this physical uh, model, um, it will um, go into the neutral position and it will never actually cross it. So the oscillation will not exist in this particular case. It will be movement from the uh, uh, stretched most position towards the uh, the neutral position speed will be a little bit greater in the beginning but then slower and slower <coughs> but it will never reach the neutral position it will never cross into the squeezing of the spring so there is no oscillation in this case so this particular condition when this is positive results in um, uh, in non-existing oscillation in this particular case. So spring will just push, well, pull rather, it will pull the object towards neutral position after I have stretched it in this in, uh, initially, and it will be slower and slower and slower and will never basically reach it, never cross the neutral uh, position. This is called overdamping. So the whole lecture, this whole lecture is about this particular case of overdamping, which means our environment is so thick, so viscosous, viscose, viscose or whatever, 
um, viscosity is so high that it will be just slowly moving towards neutral position and never cross it and never squeeze the spring. This is the lecture number one. The second lecture will be when this is equal to zero, which means we don't have two different uh, solutions. We have only one. We have to look for a different solution somehow differently. And the third lecture will be when this is negative. And if this is negative, the whole thing becomes complex. It's not a real number anymore. It's a complex number. And only in that case, we will have oscillations. Well, obviously, uh, uh, with, with, with smaller and smaller amplitude, uh, but still we will have certain oscillations. In, in this particular case, and the whole lecture actually is devoted only to this case, when this is positive, the oscillations do not exist, and the um, object will move closer and closer as the time goes. This is time. This is x of t. As the time uh, as the time goes, the object will be closer and closer to a uh, neutral position, never crossing it. Um, now, again, I do refer you to um, notes for this lecture because all the calculations where exa what exactly are gamma one and gamma two, how it's calculated into a and b, and final solution is written as a formula. It's rather complex formula, and that's why I'm not really saying it here. And you don't really need it to understand the whole concept. I mean, we have got to the point of just two equations with two unknowns. It's kind of a simple thing. So all we need is just, you know, some algebra, which I don't want to spend any time on um, the video. So you do read this particular notes uh, for this lecture. Um, and uh, again, as I said, this is just the first out of three lectures. The second one will be when this is equal to zero, and then the third one will be when it's negative. Well, okay, that's it. Thank you very much. I um, appreciate if you will just go to the unizor.com and just take a look at what exactly is available there. Um, the site is completely free. Um, there are no ads, so you can use any part of it. And I, I do suggest you, if you are not well familiar, well familiar with mathematics, especially calculus, um, then just use the Mass 14 course and uh, refresh your memory. That's it. Thank you very much, and good luck.